So always we start with uh, samples before we get to questions. And Jim, I'm glad that's out of your garden, not ours. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have a problem. This particular pest I have issues with. In fact, to the point of being so upset that I actually treat them. But this is bean leaf beetle damage to beans. And anytime you see beans that have the leaves that have tiny holes that gradually enlarge as the leaves get larger too, those are caused by bean leaf beetle. But I want to show you just a little bit of history here. So about a week and a half ago, I had bean leaf beetles on my plants, which were quite small at that point. So I hit them with a good dose of ready to use carbaryl, you know, and so I soaked it good because that's the way I felt about it. But anyway, what resulted, of course, was I have some carbaryl injury here and uh, no doubt because there is just an excessive amount put on there, but no matter. It did control the beetles for uh, maybe four or five days, and the way you check to see if the beetles were in fact controlled and when they're coming back is move on up the plant and look at some of the newer leaves, like this particular one here. So this is just, this was removed just before the program, and there are some beetles that are back, of course, and they're causing some injury. But the newer leaves have fewer uh, holes than the, the uh, leaves prior to that. So this is an improvement anyway. And so at this point, I'm not going to treat. It's more when the plant is quite young that it's more susceptible uh, to the holes and the chewing injury by being leaf beetles. So uh, we'll see how it goes from here on out. But the holes in the leaves, carbaryl injury is not surprising, but it still is a very effective uh, insecticide against bean leaf beetle as well as permethrin. And then again, just make sure to see if you had any uh, effectiveness, which you will. Uh, check, those, check the new growth at the top of the plants. And if you just have a few holes here and there, check for beetles and just relax for a while in case you need it again because there'll be July, the beetles will come out again. And then at the end of the summer, there'll be lots of hungry beetles as the garden crops are dwindling, of course. Thank you, Jim. Mm -hmm. All right, Zach, all over the countryside. All, uh, yes, all over the countryside. This is a uh, uh, yellow sweet clover, and this is not necessarily a turf weed, but this is what you're seeing in all of the roadside ditches. You're seeing it in pastures. You're seeing it in native grasses, and this is a, a legume. It has lots of, good, uh, lots of good attributes. It's a decent forage, uh, cattle, deer, things like that will eat it. provides good cover for uh, uh, game birds, uh, great for the pollinators. And so it's got a lot of good attributes to it. The problem is it's pretty invasive. It's a it's a uh, biennial, and so in the second year it throws a tremendous amount of seeds. Is what we're seeing right now. And so uh, if you can keep it, great. More power to you. If you choose to control it, it's probably easier said than done. Uh, burning. I always love to burn stuff. So burning works. Uh, uh, 2,4-D would work. Probably the best time to spray this would be in the fall because it is uh, biennial, so it would still be growing in the fall. So it would work in the fall. Uh, mowing, you don't see it in mowed areas, and so an occasional mowing would also help also. But if you can live with it, uh, it's, great for the, it's great for the pollinators and yeah, great, so for the, uh, great for the, the animals. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Uh, not so pretty, Kevin. Not so pretty. Uh, I have a Norway maple here, and this Norway maple is suffering from leaf anthracnose. And uh, anthracnose, the, fun the fungus anthracnose, um, can actually infect a wide range of hardwood trees. So maples, oaks, sycamores, ash can all get leaf anthracnose. And one of the symptoms of leaf anthracnose, of course, are these really nasty brown lesions um, and a little bit of leaf crinkling. So <clears throat> what you'll notice with this particular fungus is that it creates those brown lesions um, kind of uh, along the veins or next to the veins or over the veins. You'll always see it, um, it uh, just kind of corresponding to the veins of that leaf. And if it's a different kind of leaf, like an ash leaf looks different than a maple leaf, it'll still be confined to the veins. So that's one clue if you have kind of a veinal dieback, it's dark in color, um, kind of brown and crinkled leaves on the leaf margin or following the veins, it's, it's a good indication of anthracnose. Uh, to manage this disease, um, the, well, I guess wait till it gets hot and dry and things will slow down. The disease will um, become less severe. Uh, when the leaves fall in the fall, remove them because uh, they are a source of inoculum for the following year. There are some treatments that are available, some fungicidal, uh, fungicidal treatments that will reduce 
disease pressure, um, but they typically need to be applied a little bit earlier in the year. So you might not have any efficacy with that now. You might want to wait till next spring. Otherwise, just try to maybe prune to re um, open up the canopy, expose it to sunlight and the wind, and that should also help reduce, reduce uh, disease pressure. Thank you, Kevin. All right, Sarah, something edible. Yeah, something edible and pretty. Mm -hmm. This is one of my favorite small trees. Uh, just getting ready to start producing fruits now. This is service berry, also known as um, shad blow or June berry, because obviously the, the fruits are ripening in June. And um, you, can, you can use this in your landscape as either a shrub or a small tree. It comes in in a couple of different forms. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a great, great plant. I really love it. It's um, uh, a smaller tree. If you get the tree form, usually it's, it's in the 20 to 25 foot height range. I love it when it's in a multiple trunk. So you have maybe three trunks uh, developing the tree. It grows well in full sun, but it also grows well as an understory tree. So it can grow in the shade of other taller things. Uh, pretty little white flowers in the spring, followed by these fruits that are developing now. These are not quite ripe yet. They will turn a darker shade of red, almost bordering on purplish uh, when they're ready to, to, um, to be eaten. They have a great sweet flavor. And unfortunately on my tree at home, I hardly ever get any because the birds will just pick them off as soon as they are, are reaching that perfect stage. But they have a, a, a nice sweat flavor and they're a nice little fruit. So great. service berry. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sarah. All right, Jim, you get the first uh, picture. This is actually here in Lincoln. This is a viewer who has a six-year-old ponderosa pine. Okay. Hasn't really been growing well the last couple years. Uh, be and this sort of interesting thing happens in the new growth in the spring. New branches become twisted and brittle. And then you can see all that sort of gooey, gobby, okay. sappy right. stuff. Uh, ponderosa pine very um, often will pick up a, a pest at the growing tips and it's called the pine pitch nodule maker. And uh, <clears throat> when these tips are older, they're going to be brittle and fracture. But during the year when they're actually active, the pest is active, you're going to find that's kind of gummy. And if you pull it apart, you'll find some tunneling there. They feed on the new shoots, but that, that gumminess is produced by the plant, but as well, it helps to protect the, the larva that's feeding inside. So uh, pine pitch nodule maker is a caterpillar that uh, is the larval form of a tiny moth. And that moth will come out, uh, it's probably out now is my guess, and maybe perhaps just a few weeks more. And it deposits its eggs on those new shoots as they're starting to come out and then the life cycle will be repeated. So this actually is a, an opportune time to control it if, if it's really necessary. Now pine, ponderosa pine with all those terminals, pretty vigorous growth, um, it will recover and it really won't look as bad as you think it, it will. But uh, just keep that in mind, look that up if you need more information, pine pitch nodule maker. Great, nice name too. I think you've made that up. <laughs> <laughs> Entomology is a simple science. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, uh, you have a picture of what the viewer thinks is nimble will, and they got it through aeration. Mm -hmm. They have <laughs> they've killed their whole yard a couple of times with Roundup, mm -hmm. and then replaced the turf with rock. Good, <laughs> just step in the right direction. <laughs> and it does not seem to get to the roots. They they don't want to kill off the rest of the backyard. Somebody else thought it was Bermuda grass. What do we have here? And this yeah. is in Papillion area. Yeah, this one uh, this one's hard, especially in the Papillion area because it's warm enough. It could it could be nimble will. Uh, judging by that rhizome, though, or probably it might be a stolen, depending if it's above ground or below ground. It looks might maybe it looks more like either zoysia grass or Bermuda grass. And there's a huge difference in, in those because if it's nimble will, and if you can validate that it is nimble will, we have uh, syngentis tenacity and that will selectively control it. If it's Bermuda grass or zoysia grass, uh, that's where you're going to have to move to get rid of it. And there's just no way, uh, it's, it's difficult. Uh, three applications, four applications of Roundup uh, every five years. <laughs> It's just, a, it's just a really difficult one. The good thing, you know, after this winter, we did lose a lot of the zoysia grass and, and Bermuda grass. But the important thing is to get it identified first, to get it verified. Uh, it's hard, you need a specialist to identify uh, the difference between nimble will, zoysia grass, and Bermuda grass. And so uh, send extension it in, the, yeah, send it to the extension office or send yeah. it into um, the diagnostic lab here at, uh, at the university. Excellent, thanks. All right, Kevin, this is, uh, you love this picture. You've seen this already. 
this is a viewer who thought the whole backyard or these little spots had been sprayed with black spray paint. Mm -hmm. And then on closer examination, he thought it was eggs. Yes, they kind of look like eggs. They're, they, they're, I guess, little grayish balls. And um, it's not uh, an insect. It's not a pathogen um, at all, actually, nor is it a saprophyte. It's a protist. It's a slime mold. And the organism is just producing a ton of spores, and they're created in that big kind of uh, ball. If you zoom in, you'll notice that those are individual little gray kind of slimy little balls of spores. And they're eating other microorganisms on the leaf blade, probably bacteria of some sort. So they're harmless. I, I mean, I wouldn't suggest eating them, um, but I don't think you should. <laughs> but they can just be sprayed off with a soaker hose or something like that, and they'll go away. Um, just, this, just the right kind of environmental conditions will bring them out. Um, I'm not really even sure what they are, probably the, the kind of the wet and dark and damp type, type conditions. But uh, again, they're pretty much harmless. They're not hurting the grass. Just if you don't like them and they're unsightly, spray them off, but take a picture first and send it in because it's really cool to look at. <laughs> and, and they come in a bunch of different colors, they oranges they and blacks. And I always, uh, we saw them a lot in Indiana with, with high moisture, uh, soil moisture like we're getting now in some areas of the state, and about 80 degree, 85 degree air, time, uh, air temperatures. They're some, cool, some one of my favorites. Some are so pretty, some look like some your dog too. got sick of the yard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, you get the next picture. Uh, this is a viewer who wants an ID. She got, she got it as a pass along plant, uh, which apparently has come from Missouri through Cozad. She was told it was fire plant. What is it? Well, uh, close, this is actually called gas plant, mm -hmm. which is not a very attractive common name. The botanical <laughs> name for this one is Dictamnus alba. And um, it's a very nice perennial. It's a, it's a little slow growing, a little slow to establish, and it doesn't really appreciate being um, transplanted very much. So this is not a perennial that you want to dig up and divide on a regular basis because it's not really going to appreciate that. But it's a very, very nice um, perennial. Um, prefers full sun to maybe a little bit of shade. Um, either usually white or pinkish flowers you're going to find on this one. And it gets that name gas plant because apparently the root gives off some volatile organic chemicals that will actually flame if you put a, a flame near them. But don't dig it up because it's a great plant. All righty, Jim, you have a question from an Arlington viewer. Um, <laughs> they found what they think is an ant trail oh, between yes. two big trees, mm -hmm. a pin oak and an ash, mm -hmm. and they actually took a picture of it or two. They were, they say they're large black ants. Large black ants. And they okay. were worried about what they were potentially doing that would damage their big trees. Uh, they could be one of two different kinds of ants. They could be um, black carpenter ants, or they can be what we call field ants. They kind of make this mushy, a wide mound uh, somewhere in the vicinity of the land in the landscape. Now ants follow pheromone trails. In other words, when they go out looking for something, the workers release an attractant so other ants can follow. And especially if they find something when they come back, they also leave a pheromone signal as well. My guess is is that there's probably aphids up in the tree, and ants love to tend to aphids, kind of like we do cattle. Uh, we we get milk from cattle, right? Well, they, they get uh, secretions of what's called honeydew. It's a sweet, nectary kind of uh, sweet substance that they get from the aphids because they secrete them and then they ingest them and take them back to the colony, mainly for energy and a little bit of protein. So my guess is that there's this flourishing you know, market of, of aphids and honeydew and they just simply are re repeating the same route up the trees and down again and back to the nest and so consequently they actually do wear the soil out a little bit and create a little bit of a groove there. So to me that was phenomenal. That was a, the highlight of my week to see that picture. <laughs> All right, thanks Jim. <laughs> Zach, this is a weeds in native grass areas night because this particular viewer saw this in a little prairie area and, and wonders exactly what it is and you just happened upon one. There's a little close up of it, it in bloom. I, yeah, it, just, it happened, uh, I think that prairie area is just south of the, uh, the, the station here. And that was a pic picture from last week because I saw it last week. But so I went back there the, tonight and all of the flowers are gone and now we have all these seed heads. And so this is, uh, uh, this is uh, hoary cress 
and uh, it's a forb, and in a it could be considered a weed in a in a in a, uh, a, a grass uh, in a grass pasture or in a native grassy area. Uh, it's a perennial, and so if you do want to control it, it would be a simple application of a broadleaf herbicide in the fall. Uh, but if you don't, it's a forb, and so it's a it, you know it could be, it it would be uh, desirable in, uh, under some cases. So that would be hoary cress. The Excellent. picture is great, uh, but there's lots of white flowers out there right now. And so uh, <laughs> seeing a picture of, if you're gonna send us pictures, <clears throat> send us a picture of the flower, that's wonderful. But also if you can send a picture or two of the leaves, that would uh, help us uh, tremendously. Good suggestion, thanks Zach. All right, uh, Kevin, you get the next one. And <laughs> this person sent us two pictures and had two words, early blight, <laughs> <laughs> and this is tomatoes. Okay, well, Early blight in tomato is actually pretty recognizable. There's a, a better picture. I, I don't think so. Early blight is caused by an alternaria fungus. And alternaria fungi um, tend to leave kind of circular to angular lesions on the leaf, and they will have concentric rings inside them. Uh, if you see something like that, it can also get on the fruits, uh, then I would worry about early blight. That, to me, looks like if anything, maybe a late blight. I, I, I do doubt it though. Um, it looks like the leaves are just um, falling off maybe because of uh, improper watering or something like that. I'm not worried about early blight looking at that tomato. I would just let it go, keep watering it, keep it healthy. Um, if it completely dies, I would maybe worry because some of those bottom leaves look like they had wilted. You see that a little bit more with, uh, with a late blight type of uh, infection. Um, but early blight, no. And it was in a container, so hopefully that container is well draining. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, Sarah, this is a Nebraska City viewer, and it, it's a very beautiful uh, setting with, with these particular trees in it. They want to know um, what is up with this, the Norway spruce. Serbian behind it um, is budding, but the Norway is not. It's also losing some green needles, and, mm -hmm. and that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it is important to remember that evergreens don't all start to grow at the same time. They all have their own timing during the spring when they put on their new growth. Uh, but that said, the evergreens have been slow this year because of the uh, cooler spring we had. Uh, they're slower than normal in starting their new growth. Um, so some of the spruces are, are just now getting around to putting on the new growth. The tree is green enough that I wouldn't be too concerned that, that this tree is dying although it, it, it is possible since you're losing some needles that maybe you had some uh, desiccation injury that occurred on some of those branches. Um, usually with desiccation, the needles will turn kind of a, a unique purplish or pinkish brown color before they fall. Um, if you had that, then again, I would, I would continue to wait until the tree has put on its new growth to see if those branches where you lost needles still had living buds at the tip where you might get some additional growth coming from. Um, so I guess overall, I would say just wait. Wait, you know, wait until the end of June. I think by then this tree will have put on new growth and you'll be feeling better about it. Uh, but I certainly acknowledge that things are slow this year. This is a question from a viewer that is up in the Blair area. They're wondering about insect pests that they might see as secondary invaders into some of the wounds, especially on the trunks of trees and anything they can do about that. Oh, boy, that's a good question. You know, with so much hail coming down, I'm sure that there's plenty of damage if there were on any, if any trees or shrubs that had branches that were extending outward, and that is going to create wounds eventually. In, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to be that important. I don't think that the, the, uh, the hail penetrates or bruises it that deeply where it would be attractive to something like a boring insect, okay. and besides, a, a branch itself doesn't sustain the borer as much as the main trunk or the joints where the, the branch is joined with All the right. trunk. So, so just keep them healthy. I wouldn't worry about it. Keep them healthy, yeah. All right, thanks. This is a Scott's Bluff viewer, mm -hmm. Zach. Um, and we did ask, we, we may do this one again, and we asked them to send in a picture potentially, but they did have some soil hauled in. Now they have a native grass running rampant six to 12 inches tall, um, coarse, lots of rhizomes, <laughs> two feet or more in every direction. Likes that Roundup, because it really just drinks it right up and doesn't <laughs> die, and they're wondering, is it salt 
saltgrass. Uh, yes, uh, saltgrass is, I believe it's native, I think to the Colorado area, as a matter of fact, and maybe out to the Scotts Bluff area, it's, uh, but it, it is a brutal, it's great. It, it uh, doesn't need much water. If we can tame it, it doesn't need much water. We're doing some breeding at the University of Colorado, Colorado State University, but it is a tough one. Once it starts going, it's a tough one. Uh, spreads quickly, and it is very difficult to, to control. I can't give good recommendations on it until we see it for sure, but it's out there. And uh, it might have a future in terms of breeding, but uh, right now it's probably invasive. All right. Thanks, Zach. <clears throat> Speaking of cool, moldy things, Kevin, mm -hmm. this is a viewer who found something that they describe as kind of like a pile of dog got sick. Oh. in a raised garden bed, uh, and it was kind of associated with a straw bale. They wonder what it was. Mm -hmm. Again, it sounds like a slime mold if it looked like a dog got sick. Um, they come in all shapes and sizes, as Zach mentioned earlier. Um, they're typically, the ones that look like that are typically kind of a yellow or yellow-brown. I imagine that was the color of it. Again, um, if you can, just wash it off with a hose. Uh, for some reason, there was probably something on that straw, some kind of a microorganism that the slime mold found to be a great food source, so that's why it grew there. Again, shouldn't be harmful, easy to get rid of. All right, right thanks, Kevin. Sarah, uh, we don't know where this viewer is, but could pretty much be anywhere. They have cedars that look like they're drying out. They have been running the hose on it up until this, this recent uh, rain, and they're wondering if that will help it, if, if those needles and branches have already dried out. Uh, no. It probably won't. The thing about evergreens and cedars included is that once they start to go off color, uh, or a plant part goes off color, it's, it's too late. You can't save it at that point. So if the plants are brown, completely brown, you've lost them. If only sections of the plants are brown, then you might be able to prune out those dead branches or those dead sections. And if there's enough of the plant left, then you might be able to still work with it. But there's no hope for the brown parts. We have a viewer who is planting blueberries for the first time, and they have heard that you are supposed to add something to the soil. What would that be? Yes, our soils tend to be too alkaline, so you need to acidify your soil, preferably down to about a range of 5.5. You'll need to add sulfur, but I would do a soil test first, find out what your existing pH is, and then that will help you determine how much sulfur you need to add. Thank you. We have a viewer who has over 300 daffodils. Um, she had bud blast or no flowering this year and wants to know whether it is time to feed them with bone meal or th rogue them out. Um, if it was an environmental situation that caused the flowers to die, then I, I wouldn't dig them up. I would just, you know, let them grow for the summer and then hopefully they will bloom last next year. Um, you know, a slow release fertilizer like bone meal is fine. It, it, it can certainly help with uh, root development. All right. Can peonies rebloom if you deadhead them? No. Will fertilizer spikes help a birch tree that has half dead tops in it? No. <laughs> That's either probably bore issues or it could be environmental root related. All right, nice job, Sarah. Sarah. She can give long answers and still get a lot of them, right? <laughs> no. Well, just for this time. Yeah. Okay, you ready, Kevin? <clears throat> we got a chance. We have a viewer who already is seeing yellowing leaves with spots on them on their ornamental crab apple. What is that? Um, probably either rust or it could be. Um, uh, uh, Scab, apple scab as well. Um, they're both treated kind of in a similar manner, so it doesn't really matter. And too late to do anything now? Um, if you want to prevent the fruits from getting those lesions on them, you want to spray uh, when the flower blossoms are budding out, and there are some fungicides available for that, for All both right. of those pathogens. Viewer has old-fashioned lilacs and is seeing mildew on the leaves. Anything they should do about that? Uh, it's a powdery mildew, most likely. Again, there are some fungicides to treat it, but if you can in any way promote uh, more wind and sunlight, that will reduce disease pressure. All right, somebody is seeing white powder on some of their grasses in their lawn. What is that? Hey, just repeat my answer from the last thing I said. <laughs> that is also powdery mildew. It has a very wide host range. You find it on grass, you find it on shrubs, you can find it on trees, all sorts of things. So again, there are some fungicides uh, available and, and just look for the ones that are effective against powdery mildew. It'll say it right on the label. Um, otherwise, increase sunlight, increase airflow. <laughs> so are slime molds toxic in any way to children or pets? I, I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> That's <laughs> a better <laughs> answer than pass. 
Dr. Riker. I, I really don't know. I have yet to I have yet to pass tonight. Come on, give me a chance here. Tonight. Okay, you ready? One, two, three, go. All right. What is the best turf species to grow under the dense shade of trees like lindens? Mulch. Excellent. Are there any new nut sedge control products on the market? Uh, no, the latest one is Dismiss uh, or Sulfentrazone and that and Halosulfuron are still, uh, or uh, yeah, Halosulfuron is still the, one of the best ones out there, All which right. would be uh, Sedge Hammer. Okay, and so it, is it possible to to pull nut sedge at all in small spaces? Uh, it is not very possible because you leave the tuber behind. Uh, you'll make yourself feel better as a revenge treatment uh, exercise, but not a very good way of doing it. You'd have to do it right about the longest day of the year and maybe two days on either side of that. All right. But uh, ineffective mostly. Okay, should uh, pre-emergence be reapplied because of the heavy rains in some parts of the state? Uh, I probably would not. Those are really stable in the soil. They don't. They they do not move very far, and so I would not do it. We're getting late enough in the year that you might need to reseed uh, in August, and that put it down now. You might affect reseeding later. All right. Is it worse to mow on wet soil or long grass? I uh, I'm always. I got time now to answer this question, don't I? <laughs> not much. Uh, <laughs> I, I would always. I, uh, if the choice between long grass and wet soil. I would mow the wet I would mow the wet grass because it, it puts too much stress if you mow off more than a third of the leaf blade, and so I'd rather see mowing when wet as opposed to letting it go too long. All right. You Thank can't you. use that as an excuse anymore. Okay. <laughs> All right. You ready, Jim? Yeah, I'm ready. What particular product or method will control rose slugs? Uh, Carbaryl, if you have to use an insecticide, but otherwise they're, they're not prevalent enough to uh, to really treat. You can just pull them off. All right. How do you get rid of ant hills in the yard? You can dish them out with a, a shovel, and then you can apply something like a drench of bifenthrin, uh, so that will permeate down into the nest and hopefully kill the, the occupants. All right. We have a viewer who has uh, hostas with <coughs> small holes in kind of the root mass. They're they're kind of like bore holes, but not really. And she's seen roly polies. Would that be? My guess is that is correct because when they're desperate and it's really and they're really proliferating with this kind of weather, they can cause a lot of damage not only to that but also to the leaves. All right, um, a person has seen a fly swarm on one of their peonies, and this is the Falls City area. <coughs> peonies offer a nectar, nectar source for flies, but also they can use them as landmarks in order to mate. Flies typically swarm, you know, to mate. All right, nice job. I'll meet you by the peony. Okay, gentlemen. <laughs> Sarah, <laughs> what has Gladys brought in? Great. Um, Gladys brought us a couple of uh, more great flowers tonight. This tall one in the back with the white flowers is called Husker Red Penstemon. And it was a plant that was developed, bred uh, here at the University of Nebraska, or actually in North Platte, at the research station by um, uh, Dale Lindgren, who is one of our professors of horticulture. And um, the reason this plant is called Husker Red is not for the flowers. Obviously, you can see the flowers are white. The foliage on this plant, though, is a really pretty maroon colored red. Um, but you do have to be a little careful because this, if, if this plant reseeds itself in your garden, oftentimes the foliage reverts to green and it loses the pretty red coloration. But the um, beautiful flowers in the red color can be a very nice accent in the garden. It likes full sun and it also needs to have a well-drained, drier soil. Uh, you can lose them in the garden in the winter, especially if the soil is too wet, they'll develop a root rot. And they get to be about, oh, a little over two feet, usually, in height, blooming, obviously, right now. Um, the pretty purple flower that Gladys brought is a campanula, and she mentioned campanulas in her video earlier. This is the clustered uh, bell flower, campanula glomerata, and um, this is a cultivar called Joan Elliot, which is a very common cultivar. Um, grows in clumps, kind of spreads through the garden, and uh, if you deadhead these once the flowers fade, then they will bloom again, so you'll get a second flush. Um, they grow in, in full sun to partial shade, and uh, a very, very nice plant. So as always, we say thanks to Gladys for yes. sharing. She mm -hmm. did say she loves purple. Mm -hmm. You guys did a pretty nice job on the lightning round, too. By the <laughs> way, I forgot to say thanks for once. All right, you get the next picture. Okay. Um, let's see, this is a viewer, Jim, that we're not, uh, back, backyard in Omaha, there we go. They have larvae eating the fruit buds on a small cherry tree. 
uh, closest neighbors are spirea, so they want to know what what is eating the buds or the or the the base of this cherry tree and what they can do about it. Ooh, that's a interesting one. <clears throat> the one, the insect that I can think of that blends in fairly well with the foliage because it's mostly green in color, and at this point it could be very small by indications of the damage there is a green fruit worm and it will it feeds on uh, either dense clusters of foliage or actually developing fruit and so take a look underneath the leaves or in the vicinity there shouldn't be too many of them um, and simply you could pull them off um, it appears to be some kind of caterpillar and if that's the case you could apply something like the bacillus thuringiensis you know to help control those and that doesn't have any kind of a you know pre-harvest kind of an interval or anything like that so uh, that would be the safe thing to do. All right, thanks, Jim. Zach, lots of buffalo grass questions this year, and this is one that has lots of big dead spots. Um, not, oh, I'm sorry, wrong picture. This is a different turf. This is the one that actually has all of this monster grass coming up, and they have attempted to uh, control it and instead they get bigger and bigger patches every year. Yeah, I th I'm uh, becoming a broken record tonight. This looks a lot like, zo uh, I'm pretty sure this is zoysia grass with the, dense, with the thickness of those leaves. Maybe Bermuda grass, but I don't, I don't remember where this picture's from, but it's probably zoysia grass. And uh, it, it takes three or four applications of Roundup once every two or three weeks, once it's greened up, uh, and that will control it for a few years, uh, and then it might regrow from rhizomes, and so that's why we all, we always joke that, you know, in order to control it, you have to move, and it is it is really difficult. You know, in that small of a patch, they might try uh, uh, black plastic, you know, try to solarize it. Uh, uh, we don't have good we don't have good answers, yeah, and there's no herbicides that I know of that are uh, that are in development that will control a warm season grass out of a cool season grass. All right, right now. and that's Hickman, if yeah. that helps. Yeah. So that would be the part of the state yep. where we see okay. it. All right, uh, Kevin, this is a viewer uh, in Omaha, has a, a big Bradford pear, which is unusual in and of itself mm. anymore, uh, has been diagnosed with fire blight. Mm. They've been told it's only a matter of weeks, but then they're seeing what appears to be new growth beyond mm -hmm. the fire blight areas, and, and they want to know what they, what, what should they do here? Yeah, well, unfortunately, they might be fighting a losing battle. It, you might see some regrowth, and that's just because of the infection cycle. Fire blight um, usually comes into the plant through natural openings, so through the flower blossoms. Um, so it can come in on one branch, uh, one isolated branch, kill that branch back to the stem. A branch further on down that stem might not be infected at all, and so that's probably the ones that you're seeing, that, that the new growth, maybe it just didn't get infected. Unfortunately, if you follow that limb down, there's probably an infection point somewhere, uh, which means that you're, you're just going to have to prune that out. Um, it's a bacterial disease. We don't have anything rated to treat bacterial diseases. Um, you, you, need to, you need to prune out the dead areas, and unfortunately, you need to prune out maybe five to six inches further back towards the stem or towards the trunk than you're seeing the damage. So if it looks brown, go back five or six inches to prune out because that bacteria can run in the water conducting elements of that plant. It'll run down towards the trunk. So um, you need to prune it out. Hopefully there's some tree left to even be aesthetically pleasing. Otherwise you might have to replace it. When you're pruning, you want to make sure that between each prune, you sanitize your pruning tools because it's a bacterium and you can easily go in there and think that you're pruning it all out and you can actually just spread it around the tree. So it's a very difficult, nasty disease. It's bacterial. There's not a lot we can do about it. Prune it out. Hopefully you still have a pleasing looking tree. If not, it's probably going to have to come down. All right. Thank you, Kevin. This is another tree question, Sarah. Uh, also in Omaha, the Exarban area. It was planted in 2005 as a three inch caliper and it's a Schumard oak. It's grown very vigorously since. I think they uh, sent in also kind of a picture of some of the growth, but this uh, top is doing what uh, we saw previously. Wasn't drought stressed. They're saying their irrigation system is managing the tree and they, they want to know uh, what to do about it. Well, it looks like this tree has some fairly significant dieback in the top. And um, nothing is, is going to really help regenerate growth on those bare branches. So um, you're, you're kind of stuck. I mean, you can prune out the dead branches, but you're going to have a very um, kind of unsightly tree with, with what's left. Um, 
So there's not a lot of good answers. <laughs> Just I'm afraid say this it. one may have to go. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. You get the next one, Jim. This is viewers in our very own backyard farmer garden. This would be what our taters look like. Mm. And uh, I think I actually captured the, sort of, not like you do, but I captured a picture of the insect that was at least sitting on that leaf, if not doing the damage. So what do we have going on in our garden? Okay, uh, are your potatoes starting to bud then, the flower, whatever? Uh, well, you know, it was more on the leaves. He's okay. drilling holes in the leaves. Okay, well, this is a stink bug, and there are a number of species of stink bugs, and they tend to be a kind of a drab gray-brown. The most common is called the brown stink bug, and we have a possible newcomer, the brown marmorated stink mm -hmm. bug. And so they like to feed on stems and through leaves with their little stylets, they're called. They're like little uh, needle-like mouth parts where they suck out the juice. They probe through the tissue and suck out the juice. And they particularly like to feed on buds and developing fruits. Um, if they're numerous, you know, that might be justifiable to treat, but in my in my experience, you can have a lot of stink bugs unless they cause some kind of adverse reaction because of their um, saliva, the toxins in their saliva. I wouldn't worry so much about stink bug feeding. All right. Thanks, Jim. It, it is kind of interesting to see all of it. Mm, they all want to get in on there on the action where there's something to feed on. <laughs> okay, now we're looking at buffalo grass with dead spots, mm -hmm. Zach. So a fairly large number of uh, dead spots mm -hmm. in this old mm -hmm. buffalo grass. Uh, it's not irrigated. Okay. We know that much about the management yeah. on it, and it's a pretty old stand. Yeah, it's hard to say. Uh, I love buffalo grass and moving to Nebraska now four years. It's, it's a great grass to have around here. Extremely low maintenance, uh, low fertility, low irrigation. Uh, the great thing for a lazy homeowner like me is that you don't have to mow it very often, and so it's slow growing. And so the bad side of that is that if it ever comes down with anything, it can't defend itself very well. And so something like this, this strikes me as a probably a relatively recent picture. It didn't green up back in the winter. And so last fall, there might have been uh, chinch bugs or some other pest. That's probably the primary pest where it weakened it just a little bit enough that uh, this winter took its toll, which is pretty rare for, for on buffalo grass. But if it's compromised already, then that it could result in something like that. It doesn't like wet feet during the winter, and so that could have been things, you know, and so it's, it's, it's a great grass, but uh, it's slow growing, and so it can't defend itself. Uh, odds are it's gonna come back. It'll come back from its rhizomes, and so it will come back, again, slowly, because it's a slow growing grass. All right, thank you, Zach. Kevin, it's time for these guys. We had uh, what, what lies beneath last week, and now we have a viewer yes. who said, these are growing in the vegetable garden. Yes. Um, this is an Omaha viewer says they are spreading like crazy and smell horrible. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wants to know what, how to get rid of them, where they came from, and, they, and she doesn't want to hurt her vegetables in the vegetable mm -hmm. garden. Mm -hmm. Well, um, what they are, stinkhorns, they're fungus. Um, where they came from, they like to eat the dead, uh, decaying plant material in the soil there. So you see some twiggage and some, some mulch. You, you oftentimes see them in a mulch pile. Um, there, there is no chemical cure. People a lot want us to, to recommend something that we can spray to get rid of these types of saprophytic fungi that pop up in our, in our lawns and in our mulch piles. There's really nothing good out there. Nothing works. So the best way to do it is just to, to physically remove them. Um, if you fluff the soil or, or the mulch pile, you may expose some of that fungal mycelium um, to the air and to the sunlight, and that might help reduce some of the, the fungi that are there. But again, it's, it's a hard battle. They pop up when it's nice and, and humid and, and a little bit warmer, and after we get a bunch of rain, which is what we're seeing now. Um, interesting fact, they smell terrible, right, which I know isn't good, mm -hmm. but they smell like animal feces. Mm -hmm. And so they attract, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Jim, but they attract a certain type of fly. That filth is, flies. Filth flies, yeah. That yeah are, they're kind of like feeding stations for filth flies. Interesting. And we don't need any more of those. <laughs> So they'll, they'll, they'll be the nice shiny green and blue, blue flies yeah, that you see on the top. blue bottle, green bottle size. Great. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> All right, Thanks. Sarah, this is fun. This is a viewer who actually watched uh, last week, learned how to take care of a tree that was planted too low. She thinks she's got one that's planted too high. Uh, she put those little plastic ties, uh, plastic, blue plastic ties on the roots to show um, the ones that are exposed. Uh, sh there's also a wire, so this is probably basketed. She wonders whether the, the knot, which must 
she's referring, I think, to the, the graft union, should be out of the ground. She wants to know if she should cover with soil or what here. Okay. Well, actually, um, you do have surface roots, but there's a good possibility that this tree is still planted too deep. Um, we see trees in the production fields are planted too deep just so they can be stable, so they'll stand up in the field when they're little whips. And since this was a bald and burlap uh, tree, and they didn't remove the, the wire basket, which you had marked there with the, um, the white ties, um, it could be that there's still several inches of soil on top of the root ball above the, um, the root flare, which should be right at the surface of the soil. Oftentimes, if a tree is planted too deeply, it will send up, a, send up additional roots um, to try to um, get the roots, the roots up higher in the soil rather than being down as low as they are. So, you know, you, you've got some surface roots there. So what do you do about it now? Well, um, it, it wouldn't be a good idea to put dirt over the top of that. We would really encourage you not to do that. But if you wanted to make a little planting bed there and just put mulch at the existing grade of the soil, uh, that would probably be the best situation for the tree. And if, you know, you'll disturb a few roots as you maybe plant some perennials or something around the base of this tree, but that won't hurt it very much. And then just go ahead and put, you know, a three inch layer of a wood chip mulch or something over the top of the roots. And um, uh, that would be the best outcome for the tree, actually. Great. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Well, we have a handful of announcements of cool things happening in the gardening world this week. Beginning with, our first one is the Garden Club of Lincoln is having free garden tours uh, beginning June, or June 7th, 9 to 1, includes our very own backyard farmer garden. We better get out there and weed. Mm -hmm. Our second one, uh, our second announcement is this is Wildflower Week coming up beginning June 7th through 14th. Lots and lots of things we put, uh, we did put the uh, website on the, on the uh, screen for our viewers. And our final one is the Omaha Council of Garden Club's annual bus trip, June 7th, departing from Lawrence and Gardens. So some fun stuff in, uh, going on in the gardening world. All right, uh, Jim, this is a La Vista viewer who wants to know whether grubs eat the roots of asparagus. He says he's replanted every year, he or she, uh, for a number of years, and then they die off. Is it grubs, potentially? <clears throat> I would not think so. Um, they have other sources, mainly grassy sources that they feed on, and it would only be when there's the population is so high that perhaps they were forced to do that. But no, I think there's some other issue going on, which might have, have to do with the maintenance or the cultivation of the, of the asparagus. Of the asparagus. Yeah. All right. Zach, this is a Beatrice viewer. Um, wants to know whether they can lay sod right on top of the zoysia grass and get that to work. Uh, n n good, uh, good try, uh, <laughs> no. Uh, whenever you lay sod, you want to prepare the soil just like you would with the seeding, so you get in there and till it up and put the sod down on top of a, a, a bare soil. Unfortunately, if you do that over the top of zoysia, you're moving the rhizomes and the stolons around, and you're, that's, that, and that's zoysia is going to be right back. All right, thanks, Zach. Uh, Kevin, this is a viewer who has early, early girl tomatoes, and they're saying that it always has curled leaves. Mm. So kind of that typical curl on some of the cultivar leaves is what it sounds um, like. The first thing I would do is, I guess, look for thrips. They tend to do that. Um, if it's not an insect issue, it's um, probably just a cultural thing, um, either not enough water or, or too much, some, some kind of an environmental trigger that's causing it to do that. There are... Um, there are a couple of leaf roll type viruses. It could be that if you were interested enough, you could you could um, send in a sample to get diagnosed for that. I, I, I doubt it. It's probably just a probably just a, a environmental thing, and it's probably going to grow out of it. So if it doesn't, then you might want to think about submitting a sample for testing. All right. Thank you, Kevin. Sarah, this is a Johnson County viewer whose onions were destroyed by hail. Flies are now swarming over the broken off tops, so they want to know whether they should remove those onions or, or the tops uh, to avoid rotting, and then can they replant? Um, yes, if the leaves are broken off completely, then you're probably not really going to have success with those onions. They, they probably won't have enough um, time or energy to regenerate new foliage so that those, those bulbs could continue to develop in size. So you could go ahead and take them out. Um, it's a little late to replant, but you could certainly replant for green onions. If you wanted to just have some, you know, fresh green onions that you could use in cooking, 
Um, but if, you, if you're wanting, you know, large storage onions, um, you probably won't get a great size on those this year. All right. Thanks, Sarah. All right, Jim. Uh, several viewers have uh, called in saying they have tiny, tiny little black bugs that shouldn't be able to bite as hard as they are. What are those? <laughs> My guess... <coughs> Simple science. <laughs> My guess is they are called uh, minute, tiny, tiny <laughs> pirate bugs. And, and my, minute pirate bugs are actually predaceous. They're very valuable in their role that they play in keeping pest populations down, mainly by feeding on very young caterpillars or eggs. But when they get on the skin, they're kind of flat and they're hard to scrape off, but they, they, they want to find out what you are. And so they probe. and. <laughs> Those little things can pack a wall up. I mean, they'll cause a, a red, you know, welt around their their bites. Very painful, and so it's just one of those things that's a little ironic for their their size, but it's something we have to live with. Especially if you're outdoors working, you know, you can wear some maybe some clothes, that, that long sleeve clothes or whatever, but they like sweat, you know, <laughs> so they'll land on the skin. One of those wondrous things of, what's those Fred say? <laughs> wondrous pageantry. Wondrous whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Not so wondrous. <laughs> okay. All right, Zach, I'm going to give you this one because it's a, uh, a weed issue, <laughs> even though it's a tree. Uh, Chinese elms, which would be Siberian elms. Uh, and this is in North Platte. Uh, millions and jillions of baby seedlings coming up in the flower beds, the fence lines, <laughs> the gutters. They want to know, is there anything that will get rid of the Siberian elm seedlings without killing everything else? Uh, no, not as a, as a post-emergent product, not over the top. Once those, those seedlings start coming up, you cannot spray anything without taking out other broadleaf trees and other broadleaf plants. You know, a pre-emergent herbicide earlier that would contain uh, gallery or isoxabin uh, might help with that. Uh, mowing in the lawn will help keep those down. They won't survive mowing, but in, in beds, it's a tough... Uh, again, uh, gallery would be the best one. Or, or ho, ho, snapshot. Ho. Or ho, mm -hmm. ho, 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 ho. Row, row, row. Row, row, Yes. Yeah. I haven't said that for a long time. Cut it okay. down. All right. Uh, Kevin, the, the hail and the rain, again, um, in, in particular parts of the state, mm -hmm. can we expect a, a greater incidence of any particular pathogens? Certainly, yeah. This is um, the perfect storm for bacterial diseases. Uh, bacteria, unlike fungi, need some kind of a wound site or some kind of opening in the plant to be able to infect the plant. So we see a lot of bacterial blights occur after uh, hail events like this. So if you're growing corn or sweet corn or something like that, I would expect to see some bacterial diseases there. Um, plus, all of the weather that we're getting now after this storm, it's kind of been a little bit humid and hot and, and, and still, at least in southeast Nebraska here, it's been kind of still, not a whole lot of wind. So those are just perfect environmental conditions for disease. So I would, I'd be worried about the bacterial guys. All right, so keep your eyes open. Yeah, keep your eyes open. And right. Really nothing you can kind of do about it anyway, so right. <laughs> unfortunately. Sarah, we have about 30 seconds. This is a viewer who wants to know uh, whether they should prune their blueberry bushes. They're calling them ornamental, which probably means they're looking at the, the beautiful red foliage, but they have good new growth at the base, but not at the top. Should they go ahead and prune that out? Well, if the branches are dead, certainly prune them out. If there's something else going on, um, then you know maybe send us a picture of that and we can give you some better, better information. But if they're dead, yes, then go ahead and prune them out. All right.